welcome back to another circular motion problem, static friction on banked curve, part one. If a curve with a radius of 90 meters is perfectly banked for a car traveling 77 kilometers per hour, what must be the coefficient of static friction for a car not to skid when traveling 97 kilometers per hour? So before we actually get into this problem, which by the way is quite long, uh, this is why I've labeled it part one because part two will be video 81 showcasing the second half of the solution. Okay, so before we get started, there's a little bit of theory you need to understand. Okay, so we've got two situations here. We've got the same car banked on the same angle. Okay, now, of course, the car's on a surface. You've got your normal forces perpendicular to the surface. You've got force of gravity going straight down towards the center of the earth. But you've got friction pointing in two different directions. So how do you know when you should pick a certain direction? Okay, so imagine this. If your speed is less than the ideal speed made for that angle, which in this question turns out to be 77, if you're going less than that, the car is going to be subjected to a greater influence due to gravity. So it's going to start wanting to go downwards. So friction has to oppose it. It has to go the opposite direction. But if your car is going faster than the recommended speed, which in this case it is, okay, that means your car's tendency as it goes around the curve is to try to go out. It's going to try to move out of the curve. And if it's trying to move out of the curve, friction is going to point down. Okay, so in this case, this is our situation. This is what we're going to use. Friction is going to be down the incline. Okay, so make sure that theory and idea makes sense. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and draw our free body diagram for this problem. So here we go. There's my banked curve. I've got my car here. Again, really simple picture. Don't make it complex. Uh, now for my forces. I have got normal force perpendicular to the surface. I've got the force of gravity going straight down. And because I said it's this situation, my friction force, which in this case is static friction, so FFS is going down the incline. Okay, so those are the three main forces we have. Okay, so I now need to establish a coordinate system. And my coordinate system is going to be like this. So I'm going to choose x to be to the right, y to be up, our standard xy coordinates, which means I have to express FFS and Fn in terms of x and y. Okay, so for Fn, this is going to be the hypotenuse of the right angle triangle I form with the components. So here I go. There's the y and there's the x. They form that nice right angle there. So this top part here is going to be FNX. This will be FNY. Can you do the same thing for FFS? You put your X component like that, right angle down to the Y component. So we've got FFSX, FFSY. Okay, so do your best to keep track of these. Now, before we move on, let's just make sure you understand the directions. Okay, FNY. If you're going to add these two vectors, which if you think about it, they're going to be added tip to tail, then F and Y is going up, F and X is going right. So positive, positive. For friction, the X is in the positive X direction because you would put your arrow like this. The downwards arrow is, well, okay, it's going down. So it's going to be in the negative Y direction. So F, F, S, Y is in the negative Y direction. Okay, so I got all those things labeled. That's good. Now, before I keep going, the next thing I notice with this problem is that, hey, the speeds are quoted in kilometers per hour, and I cannot solve the problem with that. I need to get everything in SI units, so that's going to be my next step. Okay, so let's convert these speeds. I'm going to do 77 kilometers per hour. Now, I've shown you in previous videos how to do this, so I'm not going to spend too much time. For each unit that you want to change, multiply it by 1, multiply it by 1. Okay, so. 1 can represent 3 over 3, 7 over 7, or 100 centimeters over 1 meter. It's whatever is best suited for you to change the units. So replace the 1s with empty brackets that have a blank fraction inside. So we want two of them. Now we're trying to get rid of kilometers, so put that down here. We're trying to get meters out, so put that up there. How many meters is equal to a certain number of kilometers? Well, one kilometer is 1,000 meters. Hours. I'm trying to get rid of hours, so I'm going to write it up there. I'm trying to get seconds down here, so I'm going to put that right there. One hour 
is 3,600 seconds. So you're working with a ratio here. What ratio of meters to kilometers equals one? What ratio of hours to seconds equals one? And if you do that, notice your kilometers cancel, your hours cancel, and your units will be meters per second. So the mathematical calculation becomes 77 times 1,000 divided by 3,600. And when you do that, you are going to get 21.4 meters per second. Okay, so there's one speed. Okay, you do the same thing for the other speed. So let me do that here, the 97 kilometers per hour. Okay, so times one times one equals 97 kilometers per hour times blank fraction times blank fraction. Get rid of kilometers, put that down here. Need meters, put that up there. Hours, put that up there. Seconds, put that down here. Same conversion. 3,600, one, 1,000, one. Okay, so here we go. Kilometers out, hours out. 97 times 1,000 divided by 3,600, 26.9 meters per second. Okay, so I've got my two speeds. I established that friction is gonna go down the incline. Now one thing I actually forgot to label on this was the angle, so that should be at angle theta. So this is your next step in your thought process. I already determined that friction's going down the incline. And the question says 77 degree, uh, kilometers per hour is the perfect uh, speed, and that's what it's banked for, for exactly this speed. Okay, which means, if you look at this, if your speed is less than the ideal speed, you're going too slow, your friction's going up. If you're going more than your ideal speed, friction's going down. So it only makes sense that if you're right in the middle, if your speed is exactly right, then friction, this arrow, should be getting shorter in this direction, and it should elongate in the other. So at that point, where the speed is equal to the ideal speed, friction equals zero. Okay, and that's how we're gonna figure out the banking angle. Okay, so um, let's make a note of that. So at the ideal speed, okay, um, to create a certain angle, so for theta, we wanna say that uh, force of friction, static friction is equal to zero. Okay, so that's how we're gonna find it out. So let's do a calculation now for the angle. Okay, so if force of friction equals zero, I'm gonna just do a quick free body diagram to figure this out. Okay, so here we go. There's your car. See, I'm not spending as much time on this one. Okay, so if we don't have friction, then the only two forces you have are the normal force and gravity. Okay, so there's the two forces. Uh, this angle in here, that's theta, right? And if we break up Fn into its x and y components, just like we did earlier, okay, you've got the y component of normal force and the x component of the normal force, because we're still gonna deal with the uh, same coordinate system. This angle right here, that's also going to be theta. Okay, and there's some simple trigonometry you can do to determine that. That little angle is theta as well. Okay, so here we go. In this case, the centripetal force is going to be given by Fnx, that component there, because centripetal force is the component of the force pointing towards the center of the circular motion. Okay, so F centripetal is equal to Fnx. This right here is the only force that's pointing towards the center of the circle, right there. Okay, now centripetal force, we can rewrite that in terms of Newton's second law. Mass times centripetal acceleration. Normal force in the x, okay, that's gonna be the hypotenuse times the sine of the angle. So Fn sine theta, okay? A centripetal is V squared over R, okay? Equals, now, Fn, how do you figure out Fn? Well, we're kinda of stuck here, so let's now go to the y direction and try to solve that. Okay, so right now here we're dealing in the x or center pointing direction. Now we're gonna jump over to the y direction to help us find Fn. You cannot say it's equal to Fg because you see they're not opposite each other. This is at an angle. Okay, so in the y direction, acceleration is equal to zero. Therefore, I mean, this car is not jumping up and down. It's not on hydraulics. So this upward force has to equal the downward. 
Okay, so we're going to say that f and y is equal to f g. Okay, so if that's the case, f n y is just the hypotenuse times cosine of the angle. So f n cos theta, f n cos theta, f g is simply m g. So if you isolate f n, divide both sides by cos theta, you get f n equals m g over cosine theta. So there we go. That is going to get plugged back in over here. Okay, so mg over cosine theta times sine theta. Okay, so at least we get some kind of a simplification here. Our masses cancel. Okay, so we're left with sine theta, cos theta, g, v squared over r. Now, if you recognize this as a trig identity, that's good. Sine over cos is tan. And because we're trying to figure out the angle, let's keep the angles on the right. Let's bring that g over to the left. So that becomes v squared over gr equals sine theta over cos theta, which is tan theta. Okay, now to get theta by itself, we do theta is equal to the inverse tangent of v squared over gr. Okay, so that is the formula for the perfect banking angle. Now, on the one hand, you could memorize it, but if you don't understand where it comes from and a problem is slightly modified from this, you're going to have trouble answering it. So make sure you understand where this comes from. Be comfortable deriving it. Okay, now to apply it specifically to this problem. Okay, so theta is equal to the inverse tangent of, and here we go, the speed, okay, the speed for the perfect banking angle well, remember was 77 kilometers per hour which we determined to be 21.4 meters per second that's why I did that calculation ahead of time because I knew I would have to use it so 21.4 meters per second that value gets squared and you're dividing it by the radius of the curve which is 90 meters times g which is your traditional 9.8 meters per second squared so you just have a big math calculation to do there this entire argument turns out to be 0.519. So theta is equal to 27.4 degrees. Okay, so that is the perfect banking angle designed for cars to take it at a speed of 77 kilometers per hour. Okay, now here's where it gets fun. Okay, we're going 20 kilometers an hour faster than that, 97 kilometers per hour. Okay, so there's going to be some friction now. It's going to be pointing down. Um, and the fact that we're going big, greater than the ideal speed means that we're going to be dealing with the maximum static friction. Okay, so static friction is really trying to oppose us here. So we're going to go ahead and state this, that the maximum static friction is what we need to calculate. And that's going to be equal to the product of the coefficient of friction times the normal force. Okay, so hopefully that formula looks familiar to you. So guys, I'm gonna end this video here. This is only part one of the problem. To see part two, where we use Newton's second law and combine a whole lot of big mathematical equations, stay tuned for video 81, static friction on banked curve part two. Okay, but as always guys, be sure to click that like button and subscribe to Physics in the Flesh so you never miss a video from me. Thanks guys, and enjoy the rest of your day.